As the Taliban took control of Kabul, those desperate to escape reached out to anyone they believed could help. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin was one of them. And we'll talk politics as James Craig finally makes it official. Today is Sunday, September 19th, 2021, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Very good to have you with us this morning. There has been an awful lot to talk about the upcoming gubernatorial race in Michigan. Noteworthy because it is still 415 days away. But if the scene on Belle Isle for James Craig's official announcement was an indicator of what's ahead, it's going to be a pretty rowdy affair. We will talk some politics coming up this morning, including a preview of this year's delayed, but now coming this week, Mackinac Policy Conference. But up first, It'll be some time before the full accounting can be completed on the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. But we know the stories of those trying to escape the Taliban in Kabul are harrowing. Many of them studies in frustration and disappointment with consequences too awful to imagine. You may not know how many of the requests for help came with Michigan connections attached to them. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin knows it all too well as her life became a round-the-clock nail-biter of trying to spring open doors that might take hundreds of people to freedom. We'll talk to her first this morning on Flashpoint. When the Taliban took over the Afghan capital, anyone who had helped or really even had any contact at all with the American forces was suddenly in very deep trouble and witnessed the scenes at the airport desperate to get out of Kabul. Many had connections to Michigan, however loose or tenuous, and calls started pouring in to the Michigan delegation in Washington. And recently, the Washington Post compiled a riveting account of the last week of August for Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, and she's here with us to talk about it from Washington. Congresswoman, uh, great to have you back on the program, but I want to start with, was there so much more outreach to Michigan? Was that unusual, or was the, what was going on in your office what was happening in every office uh, at the Capitol? Yeah, I think every member of Congress that I know, Democrat and Republican, was getting just outreach from folks who are connected in their district, from folks who are connected to universities, and then just random Afghans who somehow got your phone number or your address and were reaching out kind of desperate. So it was pretty common for all of us. As someone who had worked as a CIA analyst in the field, you've, you were maybe more familiar with uh, the task ahead uh, uh, than others might have been, but you were also, I believe, uh, much more dedicated to the idea that anyone who had helped the U.S. deserved our help now in getting out. Yeah, I mean, I think because I served, you know, three times in Iraq and, and was close with a lot of Iraqi interpreters and folks who helped us and honestly met the difference between life or death for many of us, I just felt very strongly that we have a moral obligation to help those who risk their lives to help us. And obviously the chaotic withdrawal would, did not make that easy, but it didn't obviate us from that responsibility. Tell me about the experience when the call started pouring into you, um, almost impossible to help everyone, right? Yeah, I mean, you, we, just, we just couldn't, it was painful and, and everyone, we couldn't keep up with the number of people reaching out to us. We were given addresses for the State Department where we could submit names. They were swamped almost immediately. Phone numbers, you know, were supposed to get people out. Um, we started to get creative and picked a group that we felt strongly about. You know, most of the folks we got out, 115 people, um, about 78 of them are connected to Michigan State. And um, we did, you know, we had a ragtag group from across the globe who were helping us get them through the Taliban, through the gates and onto the airport. And one of the things I found really interesting was it wasn't just trying to help them get to the United States. In fact, that started to seem impossible given the visa backlogs. You were trying to help them get anywhere. And in the case of this caravan of buses, uh, it ended up being uh, Bangladesh, I believe, was where you were trying to help find relief for them. No, not, not Bangladesh. We, we, um, we had some students who were funded by the Bangladeshi government, a women's university who came with us. We ended up getting more and more buses attached to our convoy. And in the end, we were 757 people that we were trying to get through the gates. And once we got them through, you're right. I mean, for our 115, we had to figure out where they could go. Um, they hadn't been through vetting. It's important that we have vetting before people come to the United States. 
So we started looking at the countries that would take them, and um, we started Googling who was the U.S. ambassador in those countries. Um, we came upon Albania, and my uh, oh, friend, sorry, yes, uh, Yuri Kim, group, Ambassador right, Yuri right. Kim, I she and I spoke. served together in Iraq, and so I called her, and I said, you got to help me here. I've got Afghans, and I've got a plane, and the Albanian government has been incredible incredibly generous to take them in. Yeah, I, I, I apologize. I got that twisted. There was a, a group with a Bangladeshi university, um, but you helped get people to Albania. Um, but I, how much of, I, I believe that you, you couldn't get everyone out that you were trying, but as these convoys were circling the airport, begging you for help that you really couldn't give them because there was no way for you to control the way that these Taliban checkpoints were being manned. But I believe that in the end, when this group did get out, I. Uh, explain, uh, try to put into words how much this meant to you and what this felt like in your ability to help as a, as a representative of not only Michigan, but Congress in the United States. Yeah, well, I, you know, I've worked in war zones uh, for many years of my life. I've worked on war zones for many more years than that. Um, so sometimes you get a pretty thick skin and you get used to working in, in you know, in dangerous situations and on heart-wrenching situations. And I, I just don't think that there's many things that I'm more proud of than getting out these individuals and I got to have a Zoom call with them um, last week in Albania and I'm you know sitting there talking to them they've got their kids on their lap a lot of them are scientists and educated people who you know educated women who would never have had the opportunity otherwise um, and I got to tell them that look you know my great grandparents left their countries um, looking for better opportunities and now their grandchild is a is a congresswoman so there's no telling <laughs> what they can do with this shot that they were hopefully given you're also though faced with the reality that you couldn't help everyone and for some who were left behind I, I, it's sad to say, but it amounts to a death sentence because we know that the Taliban is, they are somehow very well organized in figuring out who helped the United States, who helped uh, our allies, and they are looking for them right now. Yeah, and honestly, a lot of people are in hiding. I, I still, we're still working on hundreds of Afghans who left Kabul, who are basically using their life savings to hide out and still hoping to get out. Um, uh, through the country and to the country that they worked for. So I, I've been imploring the State Department, the White House, you have to keep a, a channel open to get these folks out. The Americans have to come first, but after they've all come out, we need a safe passage for these people who are still fearing for their lives and in hiding. The uh, politics of this, I, I, I think and fear, are unavoidable. There are uh, the president and his supporters who believe that uh, this was going to be ugly uh, by definition, no matter how we ended up leaving Afghanistan. Others believe that the way that this uh, occurred, those uh, last two weeks, uh, was a disastrous decision that wasn't uh, carried out with enough forethought and with enough planning. Where do you come down on this? I mean, look, I don't know anyone who feels good about how we finished our time in Afghanistan. And frankly, some of the most wrenching conversations I've had to have have been with veterans. A real, real, um, deeply problematic exit from a country that we've devoted a lot of blood and treasure to. And I support um, a commission that looks at the totality of those 20 years and what we spent in blood and treasure and was it worth it? And how do we make sure we don't get into these long wars again? Um, but uh, um, so I just I don't I don't think we should politicize it. I think we should be honest with ourselves that we were there for 20 years and the place collapsed while we were still getting out. That is not good. And we shouldn't try to hide that. But while this caravan was making its way through that long night around the Taliban airport, trying to find some way to get all of those people onto the tarmac and onto a plane, you were actually at the White House with the president. Uh, that had to be a rather discomforting moment, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, look, I was basically help keeping track of this operation from my cell phone and getting updates from people who have been in the buses for 22 hours. I mean, with no, not, not much food and water, they're with their kids, can you imagine? Bullets are coming through the windows. Um, and when you go into the Oval Office, I was there just to sign a veterans bill, you know, and, and uh, it was coincidence. And I walk in, I had to give away my cell phone, and I just, I knew I had to talk about Afghanistan. And I ended up spending 35, 40 minutes with the president, and we had a frank conversation about it. And I wanted him to know that I literally had people desperate and waiting right outside the gates, and that this wasn't, you know, a simple thing to just get people out. 
and that I, I needed his help in making sure there was a more orderly process so that we could move the people onto the airport and out of that country. Uh, people like you and others who supported the Joe Biden for president believe that we had uh, that we were electing a man who knew more about foreign policy than almost anybody we could find on the American political spectrum and that we would have uh, I think the way it was put often was a grown up in charge. Did did President Biden let you down in the way that this all carried out? Well, look, it's no one intended this to happen. I don't believe in malicious intent and that but, you know, I also believe in being honest. One of the hallmarks of being you know, an American is that hopefully when we do our jobs, we are reflecting on what we did right and what we did wrong. Yeah. And I hope the president sees it that way. And, and um, you know, I would have wanted it a different way, but we've got to deal with reality now and make sure we can keep ourselves safe, that Al Qaeda doesn't yeah. take over again and ISIS doesn't take over again. I mean, we have real work to do. We can't just leave Afghanistan um, alone because we are now gone. We have further responsibilities and the, the president has obligations to the homeland in that location. Well, your experience uh, with those uh, hopeful refugees was an extraordinary one. I know it was played out uh, for a number of other members of Congress as well, but I'm so glad we got to hear yours. It was, uh, a, a, again, a riveting account. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. We'll see you again on a future program, I hope soon. Thanks for having me. You bet. Congresswoman Alyssa Slot, can we come back? We'll talk a little politics. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. This week on FanDuel Sportsbook, we're offering an exclusive odds boost to new customers. So you can turn... I like those odds. ...into... I love those odds. ...and Lil Dubs... <laughs> ...into Big Dubs. But it's only happening now. Make every moment more with FanDuel Sportsbook when you boost your odds right now. Whew, you big, man. New customers get exclusive 31 odds on the Chiefs or Ravens. Bet $5 to win 150 Hi, I'm David Hall from Hall Financial. Did you know that the average home value increased by $20,000 in 2020? That means now's the perfect time to tap into your home's equity with a cash out refinance at Hall Financial. The equity in your home can get you the money you need to renovate, pay off some lingering debt, or lower your monthly payment. At Hall Financial, the majority of our loans close in just 10 business days or less. Get started now at 248-308-5000 or chat with us online at callhallfirst.com. At Fireside Hearth and Home, our hearth experts will help you select the perfect hearth for your home. Every question I asked was answered, and we're hard to please, so they were absolutely superb. You gotta go to Fireside. They are the experts, they know what they're doing, and they make it just an easy process. Don't wait any longer to prepare your home for winter's chill. Stop by a Fireside Hearth and Home showroom today and take advantage of this limited time offer. Choose from either half-off installation or 0% financing for 18 months. Visit one of our four convenient locations or firesidehearth.com. Maybe it's strange hours at your favorite restaurant or services that you rely on disappearing altogether. We have all felt the effects of the worker shortage. And now Nick Monticelli investigates how it could affect your commute. Monday morning at 630, local road commissions are already stretched thin. As seasons change, how will they keep up with pothole patching, snow plowing, and other road projects? Local 4 News Today is asking, where are the workers? Monday on Local 4 News Today. Coronavirus outbreaks hitting Metro Detroit schools Tuesday on 4. Welcome back. There really wasn't anything surprising about James Craig announcing he was going to run for governor. He had tipped his hand on that long ago. His announcement on Belle Isle wasn't supposed to be filled with drama, but a group still upset with his tenure as police chief provided enough drama to move the announcement to another spot on the island. Is that a sign of a nasty year to come in Michigan politics? Let's talk about it with Steve Mitchell of Mitchell Research, poster and analyst and uh, political strategist Jill Alper of Alper Strategies. Uh, Jill, let me start with you. What did you make of that scene, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't really want the protesters necessarily to just sort of um, win the day on the headline of it, but it did kind of show us that, especially after uh, James Craig then sort of tried to blame Governor Whitmer as she's in charge of state police and the DNR, that this is going to be a rough and tumble affair. Yeah, it will be a tough election. They always are in Michigan. I think, though, and a lot of people are wondering how it is that James Craig decided to go there knowing that it's a public space. Most candidates want that day to be the day they get a clean shot at delivering their message. Mm. But this guy has been not talking to Michigan voters or Michigan media. He's been t talking on conservative uh, national cable programs. So some people think it might have been design. It let him off the hook. And uh, he's, been, he's been hiding from voters. So 
um, a lot of people scratching their heads about his decision to go there. Well, in fact, Steve, uh, maybe the headlines worked out better because this is going to be about raising money from places other than Michigan, and that worked out pretty well probably for, for James Craig, didn't it? Well, I think, quite frankly, that any time demonstrators attempt to pro provide some sort of uh, demonstration against a candidate doing something, they hurt themselves. I would argue that this really helped James Craig because if you're going to be running in part on a uh, anti-crime platform, if you've got demonstrators out demonstrating against you, that's only going to point out the reason that you need to have more law and order. So I suspect uh, that uh, actually James Craig was benefited by that demonstration. Uh, rather than hurt by the demonstration. Uh, Steve, you've taught me many, many years ago, of course, though, that a second term or third term election for a government official is uh, candidates aside, uh, opponents aside, it's a referendum on the incumbent, correct? I certainly believe so. And prior to this show today, I did some research and I looked at the numbers uh, going back six decades to 1962. Right now, President Biden has a job approval according to the Real Clear Politics average, of about 45%. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at presidents uh, over that period of time, and there were five of them around 45, 46, 44, uh, that, that type of a job approval, the overall loss has been somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 seats between the House and the Senate. Yeah. Uh, even when you get up around 50%, presidents are losing seats. So. The problem that uh, Governor Whitmer, who is an outstanding uh, 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 campaigner, the problem that she and Democrats have is a running at midterm with their president in the office. That also is the advantage Republicans have. They're also running, Jill, uh, she's going to have to run uh, on her record through a pandemic, which is sort of um, uh, unexplored territory for most political candidates and one where, of course, a lot of unpopular decisions had to be made, right? Well, I think what you see on the Republican side is Trump and Trumpier in terms of, you know, there's going to be a hot battle on their side. I don't know how that party will be united, whether it's James Craig or uh, if it's um, if it's someone else. Mm. So that's going to be their problem um, for starters. And second, the governor has a great record. She's invested more um, than anyone in K through 12 schools, job training, growing the economy. Big big announcement this past week with the new Ford 150, uh, Lightning, new jobs. Um, there's going to be a contrast. And right now, voters don't know who she's running against. But I, I worked for Bill Clinton. Uh, he beat the sixth year itch. I worked for Jennifer Graham. <laughs> home during the, the greatest economic recession um, in our state and they came out ahead and I think we're going to see that kind of a battle with the governor victorious. Yeah, Steve, this, well, you uh, take a look at, go if, ahead. if you take a look at both those examples, in 2006, George Bush was uh, very unpopular. In fact, in 2006, not one Democratic incumbent governor, U.S. Senator, U.S. Congressman or state legislator lost in 2006. It was that good of a year for Democrats. Mm. Clinton in 98, when he ran, the voters were saying to, 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 to the uh, pollsters, he's terrific, and his, his ratings actually went way up into the 60s by 1998's election. So yeah. those are two but, uh, but different that, elections. That, sorry, my friend. In, in, that, in that midterm election, though, voters voted with Bill Clinton and even with Jennifer Graham home for progress over partisanship. And we see in this era of Trump, very, very divisive time, voters wanting not extremism, but help, investment, in building a future economy, the same message that President Biden is looking to unify the country and will have probably the most expansive economic recovery if we can get the reconciliation bill passed and when the infrastructure bill takes effect. Yeah. So, it, 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 you know, again, I. I I'll look at the outside. history on this. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, I'll let me at, ask you. I'll look at the history on Steve, it. let me ask you, though, about, uh, about the, 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 the Trump factor in all this. We saw him uh, this past week endorse Matthew DiPerno against uh, Dana Nessel for attorney general. He's one of the guys who's been leading the fight, uh, believing that uh, there, were, there was fraudulent voting in Michigan. James Craig's going to be held to that litmus test, I imagine, by uh, former President Trump over how he feels about the way that the election. How much of the footprint of this is going to be as I said, yes, it's a referendum on the incumbent. How much of it's a referendum on Donald Trump? Donald Trump is going to have a role in this, but the bottom line is uh, the Democrats will try to make it about Donald Trump. At the end of the day, Joe Biden has to live with his decisions in Afghanistan with the, the mandates that he's calling for, which you may or may not agree with. But I think 
you, I just look at history. History just is almost resounding in the fact that 80% of the time the incumbent loses seats. And the only time when that's not happened is when, when, the, when the incumbents are in the 60s, as Clinton was mm. in, uh, in 1998 and as Bush was in 2002. So I think it's a tough row for yeah. Democrats as a yeah. result of I, that. Uh, and again, in politics, it's often the fact that you have no control over your own destiny. Your destiny is attached to somebody else. And I got to uh, I got to leave it and, there. And gang. it's going to be an exciting campaign, I think. No doubt. Uh, but I, Trump I, will Steve, be. Steve, I got to get to a break. <laughs> I'll have the two of you back again as we move through the campaign year. This is Flashpoint. Looking for back in morning, mom. Play Michigan Lottery online. The only place to play exclusive games where all of the proceeds support Michigan businesses and schools. Get 100% match on your first deposit, plus free games. Sign up with promo code TV. So play on Michigan, cause we are Michigan. It's all around you. Keeping up with you on your journey. Working with providers to keep you healthy. And adding value to your life. HAP is here. And we've been right here all along. Wherever life takes you. See how HAP is here for you. From where I'm sitting, looks like you could use waterproof floors. Wow, and I thought I made a mess. For waterproof flooring at a great price, go to Independent Carpet One. Here to floor you. And right now at Independent Carpet One, it's our waterproof flooring event. Save big and get special financing. Talk to one of our flooring experts today. Easy tools on the Chase mobile app. Simplicity feels good. Chase, make more of what's yours. Monday at 11, a 31-year-old mother missing in the moors. We would tell them her name, her description, and they would be like, we don't have anybody here. So why did her family find out she was here for months and then cremated? It's that girl. I want everybody that has a daughter, and I want what's going on. I just can't do it right. The defenders investigate the morgue mix-up, Monday on Local 4 News at 11. Coronavirus outbreaks hitting Metro Detroit schools, Tuesday on 4. The annual Mackinac Policy Conference convened by the Detroit Regional Chamber is generally a bookend at the other side of the summer, but this year it gets started this week up at the Grand Hotel with, of course, all sorts of challenges and intrigue behind uh, just holding the event, of course. The Detroit Regional Chamber CEO is our frequent guest on Flashpoint, Sandy Barua, who's back with us. Uh, uh, Sandy, I, let me start by asking, I, I, you know, of course, we had the, you, you, we saw you cancel the last go-round, so this is the first one in about a year and a half, but did you consider just canceling this one as well, given where we are on the pandemic. Yeah, it's our first one since May of 2019, 28 yeah. months. But I'll tell you, Devin, we gave surprisingly little thought to canceling the September event. All along, we were working closely with our board, a clinical advisory team, of course, our chair, who is Wright Lassiter from the Henry Ford Health System. And as long as we could find a way to check all the boxes to do this safely, we were going to proceed and we're glad we are. Uh, you had uh, famously pushback from the majority leader in the Michigan Senate, uh, Mike Shirky, uh, uh, over the vaccine mandate that you put in place for all attendees requiring proof of vaccine. Was his just sort of the loudest voice or were there a lot of them? Well, we actually had, you know, uh, lots of people, uh, I mean, more than usual, I should say, uh, to cancel. But the reasons for cancellations ran across the board. And actually, the smallest percentage of cancellations came from those who said, we don't like your vaccine requirement. The other ones were we actually got more cancellations from people saying, hey, listen, we're still in this COVID environment. I don't want to be on an island with a thousand people. Yeah. We completely respect that. Yeah. You know, we got uh, cancellations because people were were concerned that, you know, listen, there's there's an optics issue because of the organization that I run. Should I be at an event like this at, at this particular time? Uh, and then, of course, people are used to doing this event in May, as you rightly noted in your opening. Uh, and the September time frame just didn't work for their schedules. You, you uh, 
rightly point out, I think, how long it's been since everybody has been together to discuss issues at a terribly important and critical time for the state when you're trying, to, when we really need a sort of consensus on a lot of issues. What do you expect are the biggest marching orders for you this week? Devin, you just you just gave them to us. The ethos that you just described, that it's been so long since Michigan's leaders have come together to talk about common problems and potential common solutions. 28 months and we've had this pandemic uh, in, in that interim period. It's far too long. We are seeing an increased polarization in an already polarized yeah. political and yeah. public environment. We need now a clearer pathway that is bipartisan, that both government and the business sector can rally behind to accelerate Michigan out of this COVID experience. So much has changed. I mean, our society has changed. Our public health situation has changed. Our business and economy landscape has changed. We need leaders to come together, which is one of the reasons, well, actually one of the prime reasons, frankly, we were so intent on doing this event as long as we could do it safely. I, I guess if you were pessimistic about that or didn't believe that it was possible to get everybody together right now, because many people do believe that, then I suppose you wouldn't be holding this conference. Yeah, no, there, listen, uh, obviously, as, as you mentioned, uh, this is uh, a unique conference. Uh, I mean, everything is going to be the same except for all the things that are different. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's taxing. I mean, we're certainly having to jump through a lot of different hoops. We're doing things uh, differently than we have ever have before. But we think it's really important. The Mackinac Policy Conference is a statewide asset. We view ourselves as stewards of this incredibly important event. We are caretakers of this event. And we, we think it's really important that we bring leaders together. And it's unique in Michigan. Again, no other state has something like the Mackinac Policy Conference. As always, we'll be dialed in closely on it this week. Sandy, thanks so much. Best of luck, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, and take care. You bet. That's it for this morning on Flashpoint. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the press coming up next. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint.